Oh. Join me in Luke chapter number 11 as we continue to press forward in the Word. And one week after Resurrection Sunday is still Resurrection Sunday. Every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. You just made my heart skip. Hey, big fella. When I think of what we're going to get into today, it's a, a familiar spot for maybe as many Christians or believers or even people that uh, don't go to church. They might say, hey, I've heard of the Lord's Prayer. So that's how Luke chapter 11 gets going. And uh, it has a lot to do with even for our praise and our singing today and, and really an encapsulation of all that we've already partaken of in worship and praise and thanksgiving and singing. And, and uh, I liked uh, the young man just praying, thank you, God, for holding our atoms together. Well, when you're 25, you don't even think about it, but he's 20 and he's thinking about it. I know in my mid-60s, wow, thank you for holding it together. Ugh. It looks awful being held together, but <laughs> can you imagine? It wasn't held together. But uh, thank you, Jesus. And uh, as we sung some different songs, we head into this place of, again, Luke chapter number 11, the first four verses could, again, be regarded as the Lord's Prayer, I would say that more than anything, it's the disciples' prayer. It's the Lord teaching the disciples, but also it can be said, hey, this is the model, the pattern, the strategy by which even Jesus Christ prayed when he talked to his Father. Thank you, Sean. And you, uh, you get to a point where you go, wow, should I just say this prayer? Uh, and so that's a possibility. We'll look at it here in a little bit. Some screaming and yelling at the kids yesterday in Happy Five Soccer Club, the voices. <laughs> what a great day that was yesterday. Hey, Amen. When you, uh, you look at the words that are in this prayer, holy, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. I mean, Last year, actually, some of you would remember this in Happy Five Soccer Club, our break time, 2023, was uh, teach us to pray. And uh, our little children, a lot of them really loved that. Just like we had Pee Wee last year, we had the armor of God. They like that stuff because they can relate a little bit. Some of them go to churches, some of them don't. But this one here, a lot of kids can go, oh, this is how you can pray. This is how we can learn to pray. And so, uh, you know, those break time times in Happy Five Soccer Club are a place where our children, and of course, as we minister the word, the gospel, we take those few minutes. It's wonderful to talk to the children, but the parents, the grandparents are around. They're wondering what you're saying to the children. And you're saying, hey, we want to teach them how to pray. Now, whatever religion, and some of them, Many of them are praying to false gods and incorrect gods and, and religious set of stuff. We want to teach you how to pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And that's what we're going to look at today because we're fresh off of, you know, Luke chapter 9 and 10. And uh, as it says up on the screen there, you know, these disciples were already being rebuked and well, anyway, it says we've looked at how Jesus rebuked and reproved his disciples to be better in chapters 9 and 10. We covered that in the first quarter of this year. By the way, this is the first Sunday of April in case you needed a reality check. And it's the Q2 of the year. And, uh, but in our Q1 time in the Word, we looked at 
Luke 9, Luke 10, and we saw where Jesus sent them out and then brought them back, and, and that he really did teach them a lot of stuff, rebuked them, reproved them. We even are fresh off a couple Sundays ago when we looked at how Jesus Christ was teaching them through uh, really some people that were kind of fake and phony and really they said they were believers, but that lawyer really wasn't, that you have Mary and Martha and their worship being conflicted. One had it together, one did not, and and we really have learned so much of how Jesus Christ teaching the disciples in these last two chapters, especially as he's kind of finishing up that Galilean ministry, uh, Capernaum, all those places. He's now on his trek, the last part of his ministry, to head to Jerusalem. And of course, that's a really, really important time frame. He's going to pop in and out of this place, go in here to Bethany, go to different places, but he's headed to Jerusalem. And, of course, we know the week before he goes to the cross. It's a big, obviously a big moment of time on the road into Jerusalem. There's so much, but Jesus is preparing them, those closest to him, for that time. And these disciples, again, as we see in Luke's account of their relationship, it revealed that they were, they were getting to a place where they were taking things seriously. Jesus Christ is teaching them, and they're taking it very seriously. Now, just as a quick thought here, knowing that a lot of people are taking this eclipse thing really seriously. 30-second brownie commercial here. Any of you over the age of, say, 50-ish, you had an English class, a math class, history. Did you have science? Were you ever taught that the world was going to come to an end when the eclipse happened? We're going to shut everything down. When the sun and the moon and the stars and the line and spinning and balls and... Would you slow down, people? It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. But I got to interject this fun one. I don't know, is Cheryl in here? She's probably still playing around with her grandchild. My gosh. I mean, there's one thing to minister. There's another thing to be, like, fully devoted to your grandchild. Are they the same? I guess they are. So anyway, she's probably not here. She was watching her granddaughter, Lorraine, yesterday while we were out at Happy Five Soccer Club. She FaceTimed Grandpa, her dad, Milt, which is great-grandpa. So this relates to what I was talking about. These people are taking this very serious. We're not, I'm not talking about serious stuff. Like, the disciples are taking think serious about Jesus and the instruction. Well, these people, here's a story. Luke, uh, Luke, Milt, my father-in-law, says to Cheryl yesterday in FaceTime, hey, I got to tell you a quick one. Because, of course, the eclipse is passing through up through Rochester, New York. You know, it's the biggest thing we've had up there since Kodak. I don't know. <laughs> he said that he has a friend who's renting out his house for a week for $6,000 to a family from France so they can see the eclipse. I'm moving back to Rochester for a week just to rent the house out. People are serious. Serious about things that, yeah. Now, if you're serious about it, that's cool. You can look at it without sunglasses, right? You can't? I'm going to give it a try. I told Cheryl that. She said, oh, I'm going to have a blind husband. I said, Pfft. You got a deaf husband. Why not a deaf and blind husband? Back to the text. Okay, here we go. A little distracted. Sometimes this happens to me. And taking a look at this again and be reminded, the next slide says simply this. Now in chapter 11, the disciples proved they were willing learners to be better with the request of Jesus to be instructed on how to pray because they're taking things serious, right? They're getting serious about the instruction that Jesus is giving them. What were they really saying, Lord, teach us to pray? What were they saying? Because we're going to get into that today. We could have a prayer lesson. I'm going to give you some highlights of some of the things. And we were having a prayer series, topically, of four to six weeks. This would be one of those passages. We would go over to Matthew 6. We would break them all down and look at them. But I would tell you that they were really, to me, saying something more than teach us to pray, just to teach us to pray. 
Because in this place of life for them, they have seen Jesus kind of go off to pray sometimes, come back sometimes. And they could see that his countenance would be different, his words would be profound. In fact, we know in Luke 6 that he comes from an all-night in prayer and comes back and he takes all the disciples that are around him. He grabs 12 and he chooses them and your apostles. I guess prayer is pretty important. In fact, his time with the Father must be pretty important. This quote from Dr. Thomas Constable, this is the only time the gospel writers recorded that someone asked Jesus to teach them something. Another indication of the importance of this instruction, the disciples seem to have felt a greater need for help in learning how to pray than to preach. Now, some of you have heard that over your years, you know, of walking with the Lord. Some of you have heard that. and Well, I, I just need good Bible teaching. Yes, you do. I want the preacher to be good. But boy, oh boy, they didn't ask Jesus to teach them how to teach like he. They wanted him to teach them how to pray like. Consider that this moment in time with, again, very few weeks left, interacting with Jesus Christ on earth, they see Jesus interacting with the Father in heaven, and they're saying, we want to know that. It must have something to do with relationship. That's kind of the hint of where we're headed today. You would say, if I had to define prayer, I would say that, yeah, it's just talking with Jesus. Dwayne did a neat little devotion recently on that and how that we should be consistent in our prayer. We should be consistent in our communication. But it's more than that. If you study a little bit, and actually if you like word studies, you look up the word petition in the Bible or supplication in the Bible or things like that. You're going, wow, there's some deep meaning here. Well, Luke 9, 18 and 28, we're reminded of the text and the situation that Luke brings to bear that I mentioned earlier that it came to pass as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him, and he asked them, saying, whom say the people that I am? That was just something we covered recently. Remember, he was interacting over his death and resurrection right after that, after he asked them, who do the people say that I am, after he was alone praying. Pretty important setting. Verse 28 of chapter 9 said, And it came to pass about eight days after these, thi after these sayings of his interacting and teaching, he took what? Peter, John, and James up to the Mount of Transfiguration, correct? But it says he went up to pray. So why did the disciples desire to learn from Jesus Christ? Why did they desire? To learn from Jesus Christ how to pray more than anything else. Would it be possible that they desired the same relationship with God that Jesus had with his Father? Before we read our text here in a minute, I want you to consider that if you had the chance to ask the Lord to teach you anything, which, by the way, I heard you have a Bible, he could teach you anything. We have Bible Institute courses. We have discipleship courses. We have anywhere and everything in between. The young families called in journey, married, young, single people, they get together at 9 o'clock and they go through and break down Scripture and have studies on different subject matter and, of course, do line-by-line -line scripture studies. The youth group right now, they're doing a study on how to hear from God. I know that because I know what the youth pastor is doing. At 9 o'clock, the investors right now are going through Genesis, doc style. I don't know, he's on verse number one still, and they've been doing it for three months. I thought I was bad. I have a pickup truck. He has got a one-ton dump truck that he's bringing in there to teach the Bible. But here's the thing. 
these disciples had gotten so much teaching. You get so much teaching. In the engaged bunch right now with Brian Calloway and Mike Meyer and the leaders there in the 40s and 50s, they get a great group there. They're studying and finishing up Ephesians, and after they finished up Ephesians, they're doing a study on idolatry and gods at war. You see, there's a lot of that going on, but how much prayer is going on? You say, well, that's something that doesn't have to be corporate and collective. It can just be done at home. You're right. So then there's an evening of prayer the first Wednesday of every week. I mean, of every month now. We used to have Wednesday nights of prayer, Wednesday nights of study. It doesn't, here's my point. If you and I, on our alone time, as believers and followers and lovers of Jesus Christ, we're disciples, willing learners. The word disciple means it equals learner. If I'm a willing learner, God, I'm asking you, your living word, Jesus, Holy Spirit, would you teach me this? What is it that you would ask him to teach you? Because right now, right before you, as we're in the Gospel of Luke, we come to a junction where these disciples that have been hanging out with Jesus Christ for three years are saying, teach us to pray. But it's not just to pray. I believe it's simply we need help in relationships. Thus the name of our, the title of our message today, Help with Relationship Skills. Kind of reminds some of you in Happy Five Soccer Club or Mighty Mites or Pee Wee. We do drills for skills. We want the skills to be the fundamentals. Am I doing that right, Al? I got this on? I better. <laughs> we worked on dribbling this yesterday. And most of what we did with the five and six year olds was dribbling. <laughs> they couldn't make their drink, they would dribble their drink, it would get on the shirt. <laughs> No, dribbling with the soccer ball. But here we are today, we're going to learn pray skills and pray, how to pray skills, and, and we're going to learn how to talk to God skills, and, and we're going to be really good at that when really I see that this is a setting by which the disciples may be truly needing help with their relationship skills. They want to talk to the Father like Jesus Christ talks to his Father. And by the way, they can because they are in Jesus and following him as disciples. They will have even a greater unction of the ability to do that once he goes to the cross because the scriptures tell us that the wall of partition was taken down by his death. That the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. Whoa! And now when you believe in Christ, you have access just like Jesus Christ has to the Father. And there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. You want to call somebody the man, you better call him the man first. Because he is the man, Christ Jesus. You see, they want that relationship to be better. Now, you're believers in here. Most a lot, maybe some of you are not. I, I compel you. After second service, I'm up here in the corner. You say, I don't know Jesus is Savior. I know for sure that I'm lost. I've never, I've never called out to God to save me. I, I don't even know what the Bible says about it. Or I know what the Bible says, but I don't know how. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Saved from what? The condemnation that came to you when you had the realization of sin in your life that came from the first Adam, Jesus is the second Adam that took care of all of that sin of Adam, but you must believe on Jesus. If you do that, now you're a believer. The Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave me power to become the sons of God. Now you're sons of God, which then means you are able to go to the Father and have relationship with Father God. What is your relationship like today with Father God? Because Jesus Christ has made it possible to have relationship with Father in this place of prayer, in this place of communion, in this place of worship, that you can go to him with indulgences and wants. You can seek him and you can ask him and you can knock on the door of him. You can entreat God with things. But truly, when it comes down to it, you can do all of that and have a poor relationship with Father just like his children can with their parents 
because the only time they come to the parents is when they want something. Can we relate a little bit? Maybe that's the way I was with my family. Yeah. Mom and dad, get me this. Do this for me. And I needed some relationship skills to be improved. I needed help. Well, let's read our text today. And I want just to walk with you down three simple things. After we read our passage of Scripture, I want you to keep that in mind. We are going to talk about some ingredients of prayer, some strategy of prayer, some of those. I'm going to kind of read some outlines that I have used and others that have used, and, and they're very good. And if we were to look at a strategy and a model of prayer, you got it right here. But beyond that, maybe God would give us today, if you'd be willing, some help with relationship skills and make our communion with the Father in heaven as one of his sons sweeter and better and more meaningful than it ever, ever has been. Let's read the text. Verse number 1, chapter number 11. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Remember, they were just over at Bethany. Bethany happened to be a place where these guys used to hang out, and he's hanging out here. So they, there's some things that are in place here, and they got some things on their mind here, and you're wondering, okay, do we know what's going on here? Well, the disciples are thinking. They're thinking. They're thinking. We want to know how to pray like John taught his disciples to pray must mean that it was a very important thing as followers. Verse 2. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive each other that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Verse 5. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. This is a neat little parable teaching by Jesus Christ inserted by Luke the writer. For a friend of mine is in journey, is in journey, excuse me, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, get off my lawn. You understand? That's what he does. You thought I made that up. Jesus is teaching it in parables. Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are now in bed, with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. Isn't that get off my lawn? Get out of my house. Don't bother me. No loitering, no solicitation. Okay, so this is a normal human behavior. This is something that Jesus is using in the text as a parable teaching to understand what he's about to teach you in me about relationship skills, especially with the Father in heaven. Verse 8, I say unto you, Jesus speaking, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. If you have a King James Bible, that's the only place that word shows up. We'll talk about the meaning of it and the significance here in a moment. It's when you well, have the text like that, you go, ah, oh, that's pretty cool. That's God putting something before us to have us understand. Verse 9, And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given, uh, given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Would a father give a child a stone when he asks for bread? That's pretty convicting right there. We wouldn't do such a thing, would we? Or if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? 
Verse 13. And if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now consider again the text here. Think of what's really being taught here. You know, there's a lot being taught about prayer. You say, well, boy, I'd like to learn how to pray. Maybe that's what our message could be. Well, let me give you a three-minute message on how to pray. Ask, seek, knock. Do you see that in verse number nine? All set? You're all done. I just taught you how to pray. Everybody all set? Now the message is over. It's a good model, though, isn't it? Because it's in the Bible. And Jesus is teaching it, so I like it. There's A-C-T-S. Many of you have heard that. You've been taught it. I remember being taught that probably within the first year or two or three of my walk. But that didn't help me with my relationship much. It got me started. But when I say that we need help with relational skills off of this text, what I mean deeply on that is that I can get the ingredients to pray. But when we talk about this today, I want you and I to grasp that these relationship skills can get better and better and better when we take prayer seriously. When we take the heart of it, the mind of it, the soul of it, and say, God, all this other stuff in my life is to the wayside. I want to focus on you. Just say, do you have a better type of lesson on prayer? Well, let me give you one like this. I've heard this one preached. I've got notes on it. I've preached on prayer in this setting like this. First thing is, you look at our Father, right? This is just a little bit of an intro. Our Father. So, you address the right person, right? You have to have the, this is just a simple little, again, three-minute message. Address the right person, our Father. Jesus is teaching that. That's your strategy. That's your pattern for how to pray. Secondly, the right purpose, right? Hallowed be thy name, thy will be done. I want you to know, God, that I'm here before you, and you are the one who deserves honor and worship, the right purpose. I'm coming to you because you're holy and because you're the one whose will I need to do. Thirdly, the right provision. Give us daily bread. Doesn't it say that there? Give us day by day our daily bread. That's a good part of the lesson. So we got the right person, the right purpose. We have the right provision. I've got to go to you, God, to provide. Number four, number five. Here's your five-point message on how to pray. Fourth is seek the right pardon. Do you like the thought that you don't have to pay for your own sins? Yeah, it's in the Bible. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through? Our Lord. Very good. Some of you know that. It's a good thing to know. The right pardon is forgive us our sins. And then fifthly, the right protection. So you've got five little RPs. You've got a nice little break down there. Right person, right purpose, right provision, right pardon. And of course, the right protection, deliver us from evil. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching us how to pray. Now let's walk away, walk out of this, and we know how to pray, what to do, what the strategy is, and that's it. And that's prayer. But does it walk toward the thought process of what these disciples are really asking from Jesus? Because you know what they're asking. They're asking, how do I get this kind of relationship with the Father in heaven that I know exists? We know he exists because he sent you and because we believe in you, we believe in him. Well, I don't know, because John 14, at the end of his time, in the last few hours, he's saying, you believe in God, you (laughs) you better believe in me. In my house are many mansions. And he goes on and on. He's saying to these disciples that he's had the last Passover meal with them, how he's washed their feet, he's given them an example, and yet he's saying, you know me, you love me, do you believe in me as you believe in him? There's still more going on here. And it's so important for us to grasp What these disciples are asking in this setting is that, yes, teach us to pray, but we need help on how to have a relationship with the one that you have a relationship with, Jesus, because though you're the God of the universe, you depend on him. We'll get into that here in a moment. Though you're the God of the universe, you are looking to him for a provision. Though you're the God of the universe, Jesus Christ, and you made all, 
When there's miracles, you're giving glory to your Father to do His will. Let me read this one other thing before we just show you three simple things in our skills and our skill development in relationship in regards to this text. From a little lesson book that we put together for some preaching from George Grace entitled School of Prayer. It's been taught two or three different times on Sunday mornings, maybe more than that. It's a series of about eight to ten messages encapsulating prayer, the house, excuse me, the school of prayer. Here's an introduction. I just want you to follow along with this. I'm going to read it through, and then, again, we'll make some application. I suppose that it is not common for a man to sit down and casually browse through a woman's cookbook. But after all, food is something both male and female appreciate alike. Although men are not generally adept at cooking, they are certainly just as discerning as women of those things that they taste. Casually walking through the cookbook, one must be impressed with the countless pages of goodies that can be concocted by the patient and enduring works of the artist. One must also be impressed with the myriad of ways that something may be made in the endless list of ingredients available, of course, in the right proportion to enhance these delicious dainties. Just about everyone knows that the right ingredients in the right proportion introduced at the appropriate time all have a profound effect upon the final product. Any mistake made during the preparation process could lead to something less than the desired result. So it is in prayer. The ingredients added in balanced proportion result in a successful prayer life. What are the necessary ingredients of prayer? And that is one of the seven or eight lessons that are in here. It could be another lesson book for you, for me. It could be another piece and part of a Sunday morning classroom setting a, a group teaching it could be something in youth group it could be something in uh, faith place for the children in any one of those settings but what happens out of that to me is the same as what's going on here 2,000 years ago in the context of the disciples saying Jesus teach us to pray Will they walk away and say, hey, now that we got this thing down, it's going to be automatic? Or is there something more? And why are they asking? What is the desire behind it? To me, it's very clear. As they've been walking with Jesus, being around Jesus for so long, they realize something that they don't have that he has, <laughs> many things. And one of them is the intimacy, the closeness, the relationship with the Father. We need help with our relationship skills. So let's just make, again, some simple, but to me, very strong applications of these skills. Skill number one. Adopt his strategy. This is off of the first four verses. Dependence determines depth. The Lord Jesus Christ instructed them on a strategy in prayer not meant for biblical theology only, but rather for stronger relationship with our Father. It says there again, our Father, the right person. Hallowed be thy name, thy will be done. The right motivation or purpose while you're coming. On and on. But the number one skill that I see that we need help with is to adopt his strategy because dependence determines depth. Our depth of relationship with God has so much to do with our relationship in prayer. We know this. It's possible that one of the reasons why we're not very close to God is because we have very little dependence upon him. We wait for a tough time. We wait for a hard time. Daily bread, yes. Forgive us, yes. You're holy, yes. But would you not agree that dependence does 
determines depth in my relationship with God the Father. As I walk through this, I, I actually, in my prayer this morning, I said, God, I didn't even realize what you led me to put down on this one. It made me mad at myself. See, obviously, you were putting it together, writing it down. I mean, it didn't hit me. Of the lack of dependence I have on my Father in heaven. You see, we're dependent when things get really crazy. But even then, it's a limited dependency. So much so that we'll pray a few minutes, maybe we'll pray a couple hours, maybe we'll pray two or three hours during the week. We'll be so dependent on God for a period of time, then something that has been difficult goes away. The assuage of the pain, go, and, and God says, okay, I'll take that away from you. Your pain and your heartache, I'll take that away from you. And then all of a sudden, I'm back to the same place I was, where we are with a lack of dependence Total dependence on our Father in heaven. And so we don't even know him as a father. Do you know he's your father? Everlasting father. But father may bring up a bad connotation for people. Why don't you put that aside and stop hanging on that? Because we all got some hiccups here and on the way. And say, really, father's come to redeem all of that. Father's come to consecrate all that. He is your Father in heaven. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, he said, you can come to me. You can be dependent upon me for everything. And we're so blown away when people have accountings or testimonies of their dependence upon the Father and they pray about everything. We go, oh gosh, that's the way I should be, but I'm not. We need an adjustment. We need help in our relationship skills when it comes to the Father. It may be possible that some of our relationships with people on this earth are not so good because our relationship with the Father through prayer and communion and worship and just devotion stink, period. We have a devotional relationship with God. Well, I love the word. To devote is to worship, to set apart, to say, God, I, I'm devoted to you. I love you. You're the only God in my life. But do I know him as father? He is father to us as the sons of God, and I treat him like he's abused me. I'm dependent upon him when tragedy hits. I'm dependent on him when I'm so scared that the floor is going to be pulled out from underneath me and I'm going to drop into a hole or the sky is going to fall on top of my head. I should be dependent and we should be dependent. And church, as brothers and sisters in the Lord and the sons of God, he's saying, look, you can have dependence on me. Forgive us our sins. Forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Every day praying for an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Is it really possible that what Jesus Christ meant in verse number two is, and he said unto them, when ye pray, say. Are we supposed to repeat it like that? I know that many religions may teach that that's the only way to pray or that's the best way to pray. Well, is that far off? Because Jesus does say, when you pray, say. I know it brings back memories uh, of that type of and style of teaching prayer. If you just say these prayers, you're going to be fine. So my mother and father taught me to pray, especially my mother, to pray every night and to say my prayers. It wasn't actually praying. It was saying prayers. And I'm concerned that we will dog on someone else in their religious aspect of how they pray, but yet we may do the same exact thing. Because we're not dependent upon him. Oh, Father, would you please rescue? Would you please redeem? Would you please grab a hold of this life that I know of, this person that is hurting, that is in pain, that is in agony, and will you rescue them? Do I pray like that? 
No, because I'm dependent upon me. God, why don't you send me to fix it all? There's absolutely no reason why we can't be used by God. But how is it that I want to come up with some kind of solution for everything and not let God lead me to have it? Because I'm not dependent on him. Because we're not dependent on him. We need to change that. We need to stop being so independent of God the Father. We need to depend upon him like he is this good father that we know. Oh, he's so good. Galatians chapter number four. You can't escape that Galatians study, investors. Go ahead. Galatians four, verse number three, four, five, six. This is good. We can go to Romans. We can go to Mar. We can go to a lot of places. Verse three. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Do you know when you came to know Jesus Christ as Savior, he adopted you. There's no one that preached it better than old Roe Porter a couple years ago. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, just stop that, you can teach that. Oh, gosh. The spirit of his son is in your heart, as a believer. The spirit of his son was dependent upon his own father. And yet he is God. Boy, that, that hits hard. It really does. Time for a change, Mark Brown. Just because we've lived a little while in Jesus doesn't mean we have this freedom to just cancel out our dependence upon him. I'm realizing how much more dependent I am on him than ever. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Whoo, boy, that's good. Scripture good. That's so scripture, scripture filling. Strategy number one is to adopt his strategy and is to go close and get close to the Father. Second one, skill number two. These next two will be a little shorter. That sets the groundwork for what's going on here. Number two, adopt his sanctity. What does it mean by sanctity? Well, you're setting yourself apart like being sanctified. Sanctity, treat this time with him with sanctity importunity. Verse number eight says importunity. When you study and look it up in your concordance and you look at the meaning there, it's saying that it's shamelessness. The importunity, because of his importunity, his shamelessness, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. He's very simply saying, I need help and I'm not gonna be filled with pride. I'm going to be shameless in asking someone to help me meet the need. Let me read what it says there. Importunity initiates intimacy. The Lord Jesus Christ instructed them on a sanctity in prayer, sending it unto, apart unto holiness. It goes off of, hallowed be thy name. This is a place where our Father is looking to yield heavenly blessings for his children for closer relationship. Do you understand that he wants to come through for you? Verse number 7 gives an illustration of the friend who wants to do something, who's shameless, who goes to his friend, who's a neighbor. So let's go beyond the friend and neighbor and think about you as a son going to your father. It's totally different, even greater in its closeness of relationship, in the intimacy. And this shamelessness, this humility that we ought to have should in initiate intimacy. But I don't want to be close to God unless I really need him. It's clear that there is more of a contrast than a comparing when it comes to God's attitude toward making sure that the blessing comes through than this friend on earth and their carnal attitude. It's not a comparison. It's a contrast. God is saying, hey, hey, I, I, the way I do things, and we'll go in verse number 9 through 13 to pull it all together. You know the way I do it? 
because of the importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. Somehow, he will tap into the God of the universe who is the Father that cares and says, hey, because of your intimacy with me and how you're close in me, I will give you what you need to meet the need of the scenario that Jesus is using in this parable teaching. Oftentimes, you and I, in coming to a place of adopting sanctity in our prayer life for relationship, ask God to do it all and we do nothing. That's not the way relationship works with anybody, especially the God of the universe that saved your soul. He does everything for your salvation, yes. But from that point on, it's mutual responsibility. The Father's going to come through. He's never going to disappoint. He's always going to do his will. He's always going to do that which is right and best for you. But I, on my side of it, for relationship, must adopt his sanctity. Jesus got away with him, got away from everybody to get alone with the Father. But even then, when he was alone, hanging on the tree, he's calling out to the Father in heaven importunity initiates intimacy james chapter number four going in that line of humility and having the need for god to come through and show you how he's going to come through verse seven says submit yourselves therefore to god resist the devil and he will flee from you draw nigh to god and he will draw nigh to you cleanse your hands ye sinners purify your hearts ye double-minded oh that's that's very simply just saying okay i need to back up out of me and get backed into you, God, and I need to be like Jesus because you're going to make me like Jesus because of your word, because of your spirit, because of the fruit. And I'm going to look at this thing and say, okay, I will be afflicted. I will mourn. I will weep. I will let my laughter be turned to mourning and my joy to heaviness. That's the sanctity of beautiful relationship with the Lord because then he's going to pull me out of that. He's going to pull you out of it because we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Well, the friend wouldn't come through and this wouldn't come through and that wouldn't come through and I prayed about it for 15, 20 minutes. He put an opportunity before me. I prayed about it and I want to do it. Okay, fine, that's cool. I'm talking way beyond all that. We're talking about understanding Father God. You want to understand who Father is? Start treating him like Father. Like the Father that he is from Romans 8, from Galatians 4, from Mark 16. It's all there in the scriptures. Abba, Father. Start looking to him and saying, I want relationship to be better. I'm going to take on your number one strategy. I'm going to see this here and I'm going to adopt Number one skill is to adopt your strategy to lift you high, to put you first, to go to you daily in a more deeper way to have relationship with you. Number two skill, I'm going to adopt his, Jesus' sanctity of how he's saying sanctity ought to be so that it leads to number three and will be done. The number three skill is adopt his surety. I love this word. I use it often to lock down something that God says I can be sure of. You could also use the word solidity, something that's solid, something that's sure, something that's secure. You could call it security. But here it is. It says there, asking affirms adoration. Who else are you asking? Why are we spending time on others? It's good to ask people for help, but why don't we go to God the Father more often? to develop the relationship that we need. Number three skill is to adopt his surety. What is his surety? And I say unto you, Jesus speaking, ask and it shall be given unto you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. But so many of us, maybe it's a very, very high percentage of sons of God, of believers in the Lord, don't even have that intimacy with the Father as a child of God to even grasp what he's teaching. But the disciples are saying, we want to. We want to know how to pray, yes. But we really want to have relationship so that we can comprehend and live in this place for everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone, fish or serpent, an egg, a scorpion? 
If you and I, then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto our children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Oh, my. Whew. He's teaching them something that they can't grasp. He's going to tell them about how they're going to have another comforter, the Holy Ghost. He's going to come and give witness and proclaim the name of Jesus. He's going to be teaching. He's going to be reproving. He's going to be doing all that. He's going to cover that in the last few hours in his last conversation with the disciples. But he's also telling them, look, in me, in Jesus, where you're at in your life with me on the earth, you can have the relationship with Father through me. And by the Spirit, just like I have. When he's in Luke chapter number 4 and he's being driven out by the Spirit, that the Spirit of God in him is working in him, that he, Jesus, is using Scripture to fend off the wicked one. Here we are wondering what we can and can do about prayer and in prayer and strategy and better ways of prayer. We need to commit to the idea that we need help in our relationship with God the Father as his children. That's really what we need to do. I know I, I, I won't speak. I know I need to. 1 John 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. I love this passage of Scripture. It's one of my favorites. It came to mind as I was reading through this this week. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore... The world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, John's talking to fellow believers, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. That's a beautiful relationship in Jesus with the Father. Well, I have father issues. Huh. I told you my father's name was Adolf Frank Brown, Hitler. I grew up with Mr. and Mrs. Hitler. That's all right. When my father in heaven saved my soul through his son, Jesus Christ, he taught me how to love this man. And then we had such a great relationship for the last 15 years of my life. And I miss him so much. And I wish he asked Jesus to save him. I've said that before. Maybe, just maybe, that would be a cause for me to have more intimacy with the Father, to be more dependent on the Father, to say, Father, I need you more. But I'm hard-headed, and these lessons come to me hard. And I pray by his grace and mercy that I can capture my relational skills to be better so that my relationship with the Father is better, my relationship with my brothers and sisters is better and healthier and right, because it does say that I am a son of God and you're a son of God in Jesus' name. Our Father will fulfill his faithful promises for a healthier relationship. Oh, that's good. So we enter the end of this thing by asking ourselves a question. God's help with the relationship is most profound when we study the Father's relationship with the Son of Man. Isn't it? We've been studying it. It's the Son of Man. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The Son of Man, he refers to himself as the Son of Man. Luke's Gospel over 20 times. What will we decide today? What will we decide tomorrow? I don't know. For healthier relationships with our Father and with his children, since we happen to be in Jesus Christ, his children. Why don't you stand with me and be in an attitude of prayer? Let's start going to the Lord in prayer. Go ahead and stand and close your eyes and bow your heads. Debbie, why don't you go ahead and start the music a little bit. There's a song playing in the background. I'm going to pray a little bit. Why don't you be right now in prayer? Right now in prayer. What will we decide for healthier relationships?
Father in heaven, you've made it possible through your son, Jesus. Doctrinally speaking and theologically, Jesus, the veil of the temple's torn. The partition's taken down. We can come to you, so thank you, Father. Prayer is so important, having you hear our petitions, our supplications, our agonizing prayer requests. They're real, but God, my Father, in Jesus, I'd like to have a better relationship with you than I do now. More and more and more and more. I want it to be better and better and healthier. And so thank you for this morning and this text and for your scripture and for your Holy Spirit and for my brothers and sisters in the Lord. We are the sons of God. I pray today that, God, we will do business with you and call you our Father and maybe, just maybe, commit to a better relationship with you. Father, work in this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As the music